Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here today. As some of you know, yesterday, members of my administration presented to the legislature on the state of our housing crisis and type of action that will be needed if we're truly going to overcome it. This is not a new challenge, and we've made it a top priority since I first took office when we passed a historic $35 million housing bond. Since then, we've committed hundreds of millions of dollars to build more housing across Vermont. Keep in mind, much of this funding came from the federal government at levels we will likely not see again for decades. But even with this unprecedented amount of government spending, which we know we won't be able to replicate, we aren't building nearly enough housing to satisfy our ever-growing needs. As you heard yesterday, according to VHFA, we need to build as many as 40,000 new units of housing by 2030. And our own calculations show we need to increase the number of units we're building by about three times what we've been doing statewide, and even more than that in several counties. Unfortunately, at the present rate, we won't come close to this type of building, even with record spending. What that tells us is this isn't just about money, so we must look at other solutions as well. I believe some of the choke point is the regulatory system that makes building or rehabbing the homes Vermonters need too costly, too slow, and therefore too limited and too unaffordable for homeowners and renters, so we need to make dramatic changes. We made some progress last year with the HOME Act, but with the deficit of housing we're facing, we must be bold. We can no longer just nibble around the edges. If we're serious about fixing the housing crisis, we need to totally rethink our approach, because doing the things the way we've been doing it will just lead us to the same conclusion. My team will go over some of the data and highlights in a few minutes, but what Vermonters can expect from us when the legislature returns in January is a major regulatory tax and incentive package that will reduce the obstacles government has created to build the housing we desperately need. And we went to, to legislators yesterday to get this conversation started early because it's going to take all of us willing to think big in order to make real change. I know legislators agree we're in a housing crisis. I've heard many of them state that, and I've seen where they campaigned on it in the last election. So I think we're all on the same page. This session is time for us to come together to take on the regulatory and cost issues that have been growing for far too long. Because the reality is, if we don't, we won't be able to reverse the demographic challenges we face. We won't be able to recruit and retain the families and workers communities across our state need to survive and thrive. And we won't be able to find the housing that families facing homelessness desperately need. We can't afford to mess this up. And we can't afford to let politics or special interest groups get in the way. We need to work together to deliver the solutions Vermonters need, and that's exactly what my team and I intend to do. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Farrell. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. You'll see my colleagues from AHS here. Um, we've been working as a cross-agency team, uh, additionally with members of uh, the Agency of Natural Resources and other partners that are key to this conversation. We've been uh, working in a working group that's been analyzing homelessness data, looking at current and previous housing studies, and we've been reviewing current and previous trends. Before we dive into the data, I wanna set some high-level conclusions from our work. Uh, the first being that, as we've long known, we have an acute housing crisis, uh, and this deficit runs the whole housing spectrum across the state. Um, we also know we can't buy our way out of this crisis, as the governor said. We need to create an environment in which builders can quickly, cr can quickly create opportunities that uh, make it easier for renters to find rentals at a more reasonable price and home buyers to, to find more opportunities. 
The result of our hard work has convinced us that the, under the current regulatory, tax policy, and economic conditions that have evolved over many decades, Vermont can't solve the housing crisis at any level for any population simply by nibbling around the edges of this issue. Housing reports dating back to the 1990s have forecasted the crisis that we face today. Tax pol uh, sorry. Um, but in the past, we haven't quite acted sufficiently enough, even though we've had these warnings. We've simply directed state spending to unit generation. At times, we've said that'll, that'll be uh, enough to get the job done. So at our current rate of public investment, as the governor indicated, we know, although it's been unprecedented, and although we still haven't seen the full benefit of that unit creation, it's still going to leave a deficit. From March 2020 through October of this year, We've invested nearly $400 million, an absolutely historic amount of funding, into, the un into unit generation through the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, the Department of Housing and Community Development, and the Vermont Housing and Finance Agency. We still face a significant unit deficit. Projects funded by these partners uh, and through things like the Community Development Block Grant, through these typical public funding channels, are creeping up to an average per cost of almost $600,000 per unit. So at that rate, we could invest a billion dollars of public funding and still only produce about 2,000 units. That is not going to come close to meeting our need. To better understand the issue, um, we're going to pull up data that looks at this on a per county basis, because part of the problem in the past has, a one size, has been a one size fits all approach that treats the entire state the same, and that's not going to work. Um, we know that our economic centers vary greatly, and it can make it difficult for the communities that are struggling most. So in a moment, we're going to pull up this data, but we just want to acknowledge that this is not a perfect calculation, and we know that no such calculation exists. There's going to be a couple items in here in which folks will instinctively say, uh, this is probably a conservative estimate, and that's because it is a conservative estimate. The data we used is U.S. Census Bureau data, and um, while we would love to have used uh, data that we think more accurately reflects the reality on the ground, this is frankly uh, the most objective, agreed upon data so that folks could use this as a starting point. I think it's likely, based on our conversations with the legislature yesterday, that we will also all agree that even this striking unit deficit is an underestimate. So with that in mind, why don't we pull up the PowerPoint. What's up? OK, thank you, John. Um, John, do we have the methodology slide up? OK, so you can see that what we've set here are some targets. Um, and these targets indicate a healthy housing market. So generally speaking, a, a rental vacancy rate and a home ownership vacancy rate of 5% is considered a healthy market. Now. Uh, on the next slide, before we go to it, I'm just going to let you know we're going to see vacancy rates that are not close to that. That said, you will see some vacancy rates that seem higher than what most of us would expect, and then what that then that what we know is the reality. Um, for instance, um, as of yesterday, uh, we looked at the Q3 2023 rental vacancy rate uh, that the Census Bureau updated, and it's now showing a three percent rental vacancy rate across the state and a 0.3% home ownership vacancy rate across the state. So already the Census Bureau's data has moved downward below the data that we used. Even with the data that we know has slightly inflated vacancy rates, we're still going to see a massive unit deficit, especially relative to what we've been generating. So John, if we can go to the next slide. So what you're, what you're looking at here is the regional vacancy rates, roughly by county grouped by the, the U.S. Census Bureau grouping. The owned vacancy rates you can see hover around 1%, nowhere near that target 3%. <laughs> Next to that, you can see the unit count that it would take to get to that healthy vacancy rate. On these unit counts, I want to point out, this takes into account both the units needed to rehouse folks experiencing homelessness, as well as reaching these healthy vacancy rates. Now, on the right side, you'll see the rental vacancy rates. These are below healthy market, especially in counties like Washington and Chittenden counties, it's far below a healthy market. Even in those counties where this indicates uh, a relatively healthy rental market, 
we know from surveys and experience on the ground that these are high estimates, and the U.S. Census Bureau's margin of error reflects that. Still, even with those, you can see the number of units needed uh, in order to achieve those healthy rental vacancy rates and rehouse folks experiencing homelessness. In total, this accounts for uh, roughly 6,800 units, and bear in mind, that is not a dynamic number. What I mean by that is that 6,800 units could be absorbed right now to establish a healthy housing market. That would not take into account what we need in terms of population growth, workforce growth, the two to 3,000 units that drop off the housing market each year due to disrepair because Vermont has the oldest housing stock in the nation. Now, if we move to the next slide, you can see the, these unit deficits stacked up against what we have historically been producing. Um, and thus, you see next to the unit deficit a production factor. What that increased production factor indicates is the, uh, the multiple by which we would have to increase the five-year average. That average of the last five years, by the way, of what we've been producing uh, for units in each of these counties is higher than the previous 10 years. Another indication that this is a conservative estimate because over the past several years we've benefited from massive investment. And so again, I want to point to we've gone on the conservative side and we're still seeing nearly 8,000 units that could be absorbed right now. I want to point to the statewide production increase factor of 3.2 statewide, uh, as the governor in indicated. Um, that calls for a massive systemic change. Uh, the numbers I pointed to earlier, the investment uh, that we've seen and, and the theoretical investment will not touch that type of an increase. So we absolutely need to look at systemic change. I also want to, while we have this slide up, before we move away from the data, I want to just point out that at this rate, we are by no means at risk of overbuilding. And in fact, this data and reports from several previous administrations support that we have decades of evidence that our current system uh, produces significant underbuilding of housing. So I want to acknowledge that while these are conservative estimates, they're a starting point, and we're happy to have discussions about more accurate data. Uh, but we know that it would only move upward from here. And so that 40,000 unit uh, projection that VHFA has talked about, we think is, uh, is certainly an accurate target. And further investigation, which will come out in the spring, may reveal that it's even higher. So this is the hard truth of reality that we face. Government spending alone is not going to get the job done. As the governor mentioned, in the coming months, we're going to roll out a detailed proposal on how to address this situation. But the conversation needs to start now. So our position is that we must tackle uh, rapid action in these three areas, land use, tax policy, and investment incentive proposals. What we're re recommending for policy reforms is that we expedite permanent lasting solutions for the homeless population, uh, for low and moderate income families, and for entry level families and uh, expanding the workforce. As we await a firmer budget picture, we don't have final uh, final recommendations at this time, but we can highlight areas in which we want to start the conversation. In land use and zoning, we know we want to expand on the work that the Home Act started last year. Some of that is going to be ending exclusionary zoning practices in municipalities. We collectively acknowledged further during the 2023 legislative session that Act 250 exemptions are necessary in order to enable unit generation. We need to adjust the triggers to Act 250, uh, represented by the 10 by 5 by 5 rule, which currently uh, not only reduce unit count, but actually encourage sprawl. We need to get serious about establishing short and predictable timelines for permitting and focus on making the appeals process more constructive by narrowing the scope of appeals and by preventing the current uh, structure in which uh, housing development and emergency shelters can be stopped just by folks who aren't excited about the idea of new neighbors. When it comes to tax policy, if we're going to lower the cost of housing, we need to remove barriers to investing in housing. This could uh, require us to um, look at changes to the property transfer tax, the capital gains tax, expansions of the rent or rebate. Uh, we need to remove the annual cap on the downtown tax credit program. 
on financing, and I want to make this point clear. We are not saying that investment and financing is not necessary. We continue to acknowledge, and the governor has uh, always said that investment in housing has to happen. It's only going to be effective if we make these other changes. Some of those investments mean focusing on the programs that have been proven to work. Innovative new solutions like the Vermont Housing Improvement Program and the Manufactured Housing uh, and Replacement Program uh, have proven to be cost-effective and innovative programs that fill certain gaps. And finally, we need to explore ways to reduce the financing barrier of housing construction, implementing um, solutions to finance the infrastructure for housing development, such as roads, water, and sewer. Again, a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to work because this needs to be focused on a county-by-county -county basis. To conclude, we've done a lot of work over the last few months. We have new data around the unit deficits. We've worked across agencies, and we will continue to collaborate. We also want to be sure that we're collaborating with other stakeholders and the legislature. But this will make some folks uncomfortable, and that is good. We need to get uncomfortable in order to make the necessary change. I'm now going to hand it off to Commissioner Winters. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner Farrell. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Another question that I'm sure you all have and that we face today is what do we do with the hotel motel program in the meantime and how do we bridge that gap? As we've said, it's important to recognize that the answer to homelessness lies in increasing the availability of affordable housing. We can't solve our hotel motel problem or homelessness more broadly without acting quickly to create more units faster and at a much lower cost. I'll talk a little bit about the efforts that we have been making, but a lack of units undermines our progress at every turn. It's also important to recognize right up front that the hotel motel model is not working and is not cost effective. DCF serves as the safety net. It, we are not a housing provider. And as the safety net, as that last resort, we're on the front lines every single day trying to help as many people as possible in their time of need. The work for us never stops. We've been trying to address and prevent unsheltered homelessness and implement various plans since the start of the pandemic era hotel program, long before I arrived as DCF commissioner. That work has been going on for years. We've been diligent in supporting and working with our community partners on many fronts, including record spending, 24.6 million in federal and state funding in state year, uh, fiscal year 2024, using the Housing Opportunity Grant Program. Those grants provide the funding and support to do a variety of important work to try to address homeless, the homelessness crisis that we face today. It helps us operate emergency overnight shelters, provide essential services to shelter guests, provide transitional housing, rapidly rehouse families and individuals, implement a coordinated entry system to streamline client access to resources, provide flexible financial assistance directly to households, administer the homeless management information system, expand emergency shelters, add new local staff positions, and create motel-based services. We continue at DCF to work hard to identify new shelter locations and providers to run those shelters, to provide emergency housing expertise, to connect individuals to services, to implement voucher programs, prevent eviction, support outreach programs, and provide housing navigation and retention services. Despite all of our best efforts to assist those experiencing homelessness, the challenge persists because individuals cannot move forward without a place to call home. The hard truth is that maintaining the status quo, as we're doing now and this winter, will cost us $50 million a year without delivering the necessary services. We have about 450 shelter beds across the state, separate from the hotel program. There's a general consensus that a shelter model combining congregate and non-congregate congregate options and wraparound services run by nonprofits rather than for-profits would be preferable. But the reality is that's not a feasible option in the near term. We have been and we will continue to work with communities across the state to bolster our existing emergency shelters and to identify and expand other shelter options, but that's been slow going 
It requires suitable locations, community support, staffing, and funding. Expanding shelter beds faces the same challenges as the broader housing issue. A lack of available units and space for a swift transition into and out of emergency shelter. While we're actively searching for local sites, providers, and buildings to establish these shelters, the pace and quantity can't keep up with the growing demand. We explored a more comprehensive plan to greatly expand shelters, to add subsidies and services. However, the best case scenario at our current caseload would cost $70 million. Its feasibility is questionable and so is the wisdom of a large expans expansion of shelters when we don't have an adequate supply of units to ensure shelter stays are brief, as was always intended. In the near term, the need for shelter beds will become increasingly serious with the end of the June 30 cohort stay on April 1st. We can't continue to rely on hotels to house those in need. And the Agency of Human Services proposes to establish emergency shelters in the regions with the most need for those still in hotels at the end of the current program this spring. We're also helpful that by using fewer hotel rooms, we'll incentivize lower room rates for the smaller number of rooms that we would need. And it might spur the sale of hotels to turn into other forms of shelter and affordable housing. Homelessness is a crisis. And our hope is that everyone hears clearly the message that we need more housing units to solve it. And we need them as soon as possible. Thank you. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, Secretary, uh, Commissioner Winters just said, and you've said, we need to add housing. Uh, how about, is there any work being done on reducing the numbers of homeless people? Uh, well, Let's separate the two issues uh, as well, because it's about we need housing in all sectors. We need middle income housing. Uh, we just we're desperate for more housing, which will solve a lot of the other issues to free up um, less expensive housing as well. So um, we have to, again, focus this conversation on we need those units, regardless of the homeless population, we need more units on the ground. So that's been going to be our focus. And we'll, we'll um, again, work on the homeless population uh, in conjunction with that. Uh, but the main focus is really about building more units. Commissioner Winters yesterday and today mentioned uh, potentially setting up several shelters in different communities. How, how do you expect to, to, to pull this off in such a short amount of time, especially given that the one in Burlington has run into yeah. some pushback? Well, again, that's why we need um, some, some assistance from the legislature. Um, we have to think bold here. We're going to need regulatory reform in order to accomplish this. Um, so everything's got to be on the table. Now, I know um, in the past the speaker has called on me to to um, to have a state of emergency uh, with housing, um, and I would say that's not off the table. My preference, my preference, would be to work with the legislature hand in hand to accomplish this together and get the results we need. But that's still an option. What would you need to see before issuing a state of emergency where the guard could set up Again, tents or structure? Cooperation from a regulatory perspective. Um, I think would be very helpful. Tax incentives, tax credits, and so forth would be helpful. You know, this is uh, simply uh, an economics issue, um, supply and demand. Uh, we have more demand than we have supply. So we need to reverse that. You know, we need more, we need more supply, and, and that will reduce the demand, reduce the prices as a result. So um, from my perspective, it's, it's economics 101. Were there any, ever any discussions in the administration or in the legislature, for that matter, to, to buy some of these hotels? We've funneled hundreds of millions. Sure. A lot of the, the housing trusts across Vermont uh, have been doing that. Uh, we still believe that there's a path forward. If we can find some, that would be helpful, as Commissioner Winters had said. Um, but there probably isn't near enough uh, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. Is that accurate, Commissioner? Yeah. That's accurate, Governor. There have been a, a few dozen uh, different hotel and motel conversions over the years. It takes time, um, and it takes uh, a willing market. Right now, with the hotel model that we have right now, it's much more profitable to keep people 
in those hotels keep uh, keep those rooms full. So we think with uh, using less rooms, uh, the fair market value for some of those hotels might go down. There might be more of an incentive for hotel and motel owners to work with us and transition those to different types of housing. It's all, all part of the problem. And I do just want to say that we, we have been working on uh, emergency shelter siting. That those are conversations that have been going on for a very long time. So a lot of those are already in process. Um, so we don't want to overpromise that we'll be able to, to stand up shelters in, in uh, five or six communities by April 1st, but we're pretty optimistic about it, and it's going to take community support to really make that happen in partnerships, uh, as the governor mentioned. Are you able to share where some of these might be? Well, we look at the, the areas of highest need. You know, right now it's, it's Chittenden County, it's Central Vermont, it's Rutland County, uh, Bennington and Brattleboro areas. Those are the five areas with the most concentration of uh, hotels and um, people experiencing homelessness. So we start there, but we're really open to a lot of different options in different areas. For the governor, um, yesterday at the hearing, bold, getting uncomfortable, maybe some of the key words we saw last year with S100, the Home Act. There was some Act 250 reform, but former Commissioner Hanford, I know you still would have liked to see more, but I guess. Where's your confidence level rank? I mean, with the Democrat supermajority in our mentalist, like how confident are you you can get them on your side for these more uncomfortable and bold changes? Yeah, well, again, if this is truly a crisis, as many, many have stated, uh, stated that this is an emergency that we have on our hands, we have to treat it as such. Um, so we have to come together. And when that happens, I mean, we've seen it with the pandemic, we've seen it with the flooding in July, uh, with the state of emergency, you have to introduce measures that make people uncomfortable. And it makes some of our own secretaries and commissioners uncomfortable with what we have to do uh, to achieve the goal of getting people back on their feet and, and keeping people safe. And if this is truly a crisis, then I would expect that they would rally and, and that they would, they would want to do what, what's best for the community at large, Vermont at large. So I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but, um, but again, we'll, um, I think the Home Act, uh, you, you know, that's a great example, I think, of uh, it was a good uh, provision, uh, but it didn't go far enough. In fact, uh, I was having second thoughts about whether I was going to sign it at one point because I didn't think it went far enough. Uh, and uh, it's proven to be helpful, but, uh, but we need more of that. So. It was the same with, um, you know, with um, um, reform to our pension system. Um, as you remember, I vetoed that because I didn't think it went far enough and it wasn't going to accomplish the goal. Um, I wasn't successful uh, in my, my veto, uh, but uh, but I think it's proven to be the case. It was it didn't go far enough, and we didn't uh, we didn't accomplish what we'd hoped. Uh, and you'll see that that's for another day, uh, but there's a deficit there as well. And so obviously yesterday these three were all at the Joint Fiscal Committee hearing, but are you planning on speaking with the Speaker or Pro Tem kind of heading into the session to lay down these priorities, or what does that communication look like we'll, right now? We'll work with legislative leadership as well as, uh, you know, the chairs of committees, appropriate committees, um, to try and flesh out some of this as we develop it. But you haven't had any conversations directly with them yet? I have not. Why? Um, we haven't fleshed out all the details and what we need. Um, we're, we're developing that uh, as we go. I think uh, some of what we've talked about, this, is n this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, uh, but, um, but I think really diving into the details, collecting the data uh, has opened my eyes, and I hope uh, it'll open their eyes to how extreme this issue is, and it's about the number of units that we need in order to, to level set. Uh, and so uh, to get ahead of this, we're going to just have to do a lot more than we've been doing. Certainly the flooding has compounded some of these housing challenges. I believe folks at the Berlin Mobile Home Park, I think just paid their fourth month rent, uh, but there's still, some have been removed, but there's still many homes there. Where do we stand in terms of, of the cleanup and removal? Yeah, we're, we're negotiating uh, with the owner of the park right now. Um, we're ready uh, to go in there. Um, they may want to take care of some of them themselves, but uh, those are details we're, we're working out. The lot rent uh, has ceased. For those, we have, uh, we have made agreement with some of the 
uh, mobile home owners, and uh, we've taken possession of them. We've given them um, some money uh, to, to supplement what they receive from FEMA to get them up to the 41,000. And uh, so those are really in uh, the state's possession. So they aren't, they do not owe uh, lot rent at this point. Uh, the physical space itself, I know it's private, it's owned by the, the owner. Uh, we talk about the buyout program for Barry and some of these other communities. I mean, would that ever be in the cards for the state to buy out that, that plot of land or would, river run just up? Yeah, high? no, I think everything is on the table. Um, we'd have to have a willing partner. I'm not sure what the park owner is contemplating in it. We have to have the community. The municipality has to be a partner as well. And that gets uh, difficult uh, because we talk about the grand list, reducing the, uh, the size of the grand list uh, by reducing the number of homes that would be able to be uh, to be in in that um, for tax purposes. So it's uh, but it's part of the conversation. Yes. Do you have any data on what might be called existing housing but uninhabitable at the moment? I'm sure we have that somewhere, um, but uh, we'll be talking hundreds, thousands. I, I from what I hear, we lose um, you know thousands uh, on a yearly basis that. Uh, that are no longer habitable. And um, and those are the types of homes that we talked about with our VHIP program. It was something that I thought about uh, years ago when I go through, went through my hometown of Barrie uh, to see some of the beautiful homes uh, that are there that are dilapidated, Victorian homes and so forth, that are no longer housing anyone, uh, but they needed help. They needed some assistance. They needed some funding in order to bring them back uh, up to you know some some level of uh, habitability, so um, that's you why that's why we use the VHIP. Less than new housing. Oh yeah, I, yes, VHIP program that we've uh, we put into place. We had the legislature uh, adopted that with us. Um, that has proven uh, to be very cost effective, and it's not the total answer. Uh, but no. you think about the the number of homes we have. In, uh, in in Barrie and Rutland and 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 Burlington and Chittenden County that uh, maybe uh, need some help and in, in, uh, assistance and in, in trying to to get them again to that uh, level of habitability um, that's a benefit to us for far less money. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Farrell talk about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I cited a number before. We're seeing new construction of of these publicly funded units. Uh, approaching six hundred thousand dollars, six hundred thousand dollars per unit. By comparison, VHIP that the governor mentioned, those rehab units are coming online for about thirty thousand dollars each, and we've seen hundreds of those come online. Right. Since, Is that for similar square footage? Uh, yes, it would be. It's it's on a per unit basis, but it could take a bunch of different forms. It could be bringing a uh, unit back up to code to get back online, or it could be taking an old Victorian and splitting it up into <clears throat> two or three units. Uh, but it's vastly more cost effective. Um, I lived in a community that had a housing, uh, unhoused problem. They hired a consultant for $50,000. And the report was basically, if you build it, they will come. If, if you do the right thing and provide more shelter and more food, you, you will have more homeless. Well, I think uh, I would take that as if we build it, they will come in terms of attracting more people into the state, uh, more workers, more. No, we're talking more homeless. Well, I'm, I'm talking about uh, <laughs> quite, quite the opposite. I think a, a vibrant economy uh, will help the homeless. And I think that we, we need to address this, uh, this housing issue that we have. And I believe that will reduce uh, the demand for, for homeless housing because it'll lift the economy and inject the economy with, a, with the workers we need uh, to supplement the income. So I think it's all, all positive uh, if we focus on housing in general. I think it will help the homeless population as well in many different ways. I noticed the data that the two southern counties had the most available units by quite a bit. Is that a part of an economic problem or I, any I, unique? Well, if it's a southern... Uh, Wind Windham and Denny, yeah. 6 well, to 7% again, versus 0 or 1%. I think if you go and take a look at what happened during that period of time, Vermont Yankee closed, right, in Windham County, um, I would say there's a direct correlation there with the number of jobs that were lost in that area, high-paying positions 
that were lost in that, uh, in that area to what we're seeing today. You can look over in Bennington and you can see EverReady's gone. There's been many, many manufacturing um, um, entities uh, that... that uh, economic. I think, I think a lot of it is economic, but... I think, I think that's right, yep. Governor, you mentioned um, taxes or tax proposals could be on the table uh, next Will session. Be. Will be. Will be, excuse me. Will be. Tomorrow at the State House, um, there's going to be a, a coalition, the American Civil Liberties Union, the Natural Resources Council, um, a few others. They're, they're going to be presenting a proposal that they say will uh, ensure that the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes. You can imagine that means taxing more wealthy. Vermonters. Yeah, we have a pretty progressive um, tax policy here in the state already. I'm not sure how many more um, of the wealthy there are and how much more we're going to reap from them without them moving. I, I think, again, we should be thinking about how do we get our economy revved back up? How do we invest in, in the middle income Vermonters uh, to, to provide for another middle income uh, that we're, we're losing? Um, we don't have that many. I don't think we have that many affluent people in Vermont, um, but we sure have uh, a number of people on the other end of the scale that need some help, and especially in the rural sections. The communities have been left behind, We'd, and I've talked a lot about this. That's why we focus so heavily on on the other. Uh, you know, we have three or four counties, one in particular, but two, three counties that are doing okay. They could be doing better, but they're doing okay. But the others, you know, the other 10, 11, 12 counties need some help. And their economic centers um, are not anywhere near what they used to be. And that's why we need to invest in those communities to bring back their economy, uh, which will lift them up and lift the whole state up uh, to be more economically vibrant. You, you mentioned the story of two Vermonts, if you will. I guess it's nothing new. But, but what would you like to see in terms of a tax policy for next session to help with housing? Well, we're going to look at, uh, you know, incentivized building housing. I mean, that's our focus. And to do that, it has to be advantageous for those who are considering it. So tax credits, um, I think, would be on the table. Um, because, and I know the pushback will be, well, we're, we're just giving uh, tax breaks. Well, we're not receiving the tax now because they're not building enough housing. So if we can energize uh, the, uh, the housing market, provide tax credit, I think we'll benefit as a result on both ends, more housing, and I think we'll have more income. Yeah. We've got a few folks on the phone uh, we'll go to now. We'll start with Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. You know, Tim, we'll go to Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I think this might be for Commissioner Farrell uh, or Governor um, if you go back to the slide deck that you uh, presented, uh, if it's so that it can be explained to the public who some of them are like me and won't fully understand what the math transfers to, I'd like to ask you about the current unit production. Mm -hmm. um, if you take Washington County as an example, and you say the unit deficit is 771 units, is that over a five-year period that, that Washington County built 771 less than they needed to during that period of time? So what that indicates is that if you take the average number of units produced in Washington County over the last, last five years and then that average annual production, um, the 771 that's needed uh, would require an increase of 4.7 uh, compared to, that's the multiplier compared to what has been annually produced on average over the past five years. So, you know, just to use square numbers, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say we had a county, and we don't, but let's say we had a county who had um, an average production over the last five years of 100. Well, that would mean that it w a 4.7 percent increase factor would mean they would need to increase by uh, 470 units. So that gives you the sense of scale here. And so that would be 470 units over five years? Nope. <clears throat> so, 
annually. That, that, annually. That's right. That would be compared to their annual production. So that would be, uh, think of it as a point in time right now. So Washington County would need to produce 3,624 homes or units per year to, to try to ramp back up to a stable point, correct? I think rather a better way to think of it is that at this point in time, this is the number of units that would be needed right now and then that would level us off so we would need to continue producing at a level rate to maintain healthy vacancy rates uh, and to overcome the the um, two to three thousand units lost per year statewide due to housing atrophy but this does not contemplate uh, sort of a forward projection that is rather left to things like the housing needs assessment vhfa's projections this is more of a point in time what's the deficit and how does that compare to what these units have been producing on an annual basis Thanks, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, one more question. Governor, uh, when you look at the, the leadership in Vermont, who, uh, whether it's with groups or individuals, organizations, who need uh, the most convincing to relax a lot of the regulatory matters that are still slowing the process in Vermont so much, um, is there a short list of those you're comfortable discussing? Um. Yeah, we just need we just need the buy-in from legislators to do this. We need, you know, 76 of them in the House, and another 16 in the Senate. And the main part, when they say they recognize the problem, but they didn't do much really to help. S100 was a first step in that direction, but the resistance. Uh, do you have a sense of? Um, if they see if, if they actually have been out into the into the uh, into the rural areas of Vermont and seen what the actual housing issues are. Yeah, I, I want to be fair about this as well. I mean, this data that we put together is really stark, and it's something that we just put together. Um, and going through the reports have been done over the last uh, few decades, and pulled all this uh, together now. Uh, so I, I want to give them uh, the benefit of the doubt because they haven't seen it. So maybe when they see what we've uh, we've uncovered, uh, they will come to the conclusion they have to to rally and they have to we have to come together in order to to do what's right. Understood. Thank you very much. Lola VT Digger. Um, no questions for me today. Thank you. Ed Barber, Newport Daily Express. Back to the room. Um, political future. You giving that some thought? Um, not a lot of thought. No. <laughs> um, when will you make? You're thinking public. Sometime between now and November. We're in November. Next November. Oh, next. <laughs> so, Governor, I, I do understand that the purpose of the, the, the big picture is more housing. I get that. Um, I do want to return to my original question, and maybe, maybe this is more for Commissioner Winters. I don't know. But it's listening to Burlington City Council meeting last night it was really clear. Housing first, no idea, no even discussion about re how can we reduce the number of homeless people. And does the state have any sort of plan for perhaps linking homeless services for working on the root problems? that landed people in homelessness, yeah. you know, something no, like that. No, we do, uh, and I'll let Commissioner Winters answer that uh, more directly. Um, but that's part of the failure of the hotel motel program, was that they didn't have the services, the wraparound services, we didn't have eyes on them, we didn't have helping hands uh, to, to lift them out of homelessness. Um, so this approach, doing things differently, uh, so that we can provide those services to, to, to help them, uh, address their needs, I think would reduce homelessness in the future. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think it's important to remember that one of the roots here is having enough housing units. And that's where we want to focus right now. We are doing a lot of work 
uh, to connect people to services, uh, mental health services, substance use services, uh, other health care, employment training. That's work that happens every day in, in the Agency of Human Services. Uh, but we really need to focus on units for people to move into more stable situations and be able to move on with their lives. Is there any sense, Chris, of uh, saying we're going to help you with housing, but you must, not, not just we're offering, not just we're mentioning, but as a requirement for ongoing help, you need to work on your substance abuse, mental health, domestic abuse, uh, work skills, whatever it is, identify it as the reason they're there. A quid pro quo of some kind. It really depends on the individual. That is how a lot of shelter situations operate. Uh, with the legislation that was passed for the June 30 cohort, uh, those folks are required to be connected to coordinated entry um, and work with caseworkers. Uh, so there, there is some of that in the existing system. Thank you. What, what do you expect, I guess the last question would be, what do you expect that to look like if and when we have these shelters online by April or maybe further out. I mean, some some have already criticized the the plan, saying that you know 30 or maybe more people living in a room like this, it's not necessarily a therapeutic or an easy scenario or setting to to get back on your feet and access these services. Yeah. Again, those are those are contingency plans, and we would love to have. Uh, much less need there by having more housing units and not having to make those contingency plans, by having fewer people in homelessness, uh, by having less need for emergency shelters. Um, congregate situations are not ideal, especially for families, and we'll have to explore all, all sorts of different options for those shelters uh, come April 1st, long before April 1st. Again, Calvin, I just want to to make sure that we point out uh, it isn't lost on us that uh, the families aren't appropriate in some of those settings. Uh, but there are other ways to deal with that. And, and I, I don't think we put out any plan at this point about what they would look like. So you could take a, a big uh, area and, and you could segment, segment uh, some of it off and create different, more private areas within this, this shelter. So. It isn't this mass auditorium where we have just beds laid out uh, for everyone. Um, individuals might be uh, different. Might, it depends on the person. But we want to make sure that we respect the needs of families as well and kids. Thank you all very much.